It's day one of Bloomborough Spoilers, and this set looks whimsical and amazing, so let's break it down. Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Sephrod Olive, and it's time for our first daily dose of Bloomboro spoilers. So Bloomboro, releasing the end of the month, we just started spoiler season today with Wizards having this huge stream showing off a ton of cards, and I gotta say... I wasn't sure what I was going to think of this set. The theme of this set is kind of like animal folk, all these cute little animals. But after seeing the art of this set and the showcase styles in the cards, I am a million percent on board. This set looks so good. And I would say it might have some of the best art that we've seen in Magic in like the modern era. Going back more than a decade, the art in this set is so good. The designs are good. The mechanics are good. But we have a ton of stuff to talk about. It is going to be an incredibly long video, which means we should probably jump right Right into it start talking new bloomboro cards before we do a couple of quick reminders first if you need any of these cards you can snag it from our sponsor card kingdom over at card kingdom.com slash mtg goldfish second to keep up on all the latest spoilers throughout the day you should head on over to mtgpreviews.com anyway Let's start exploring Bloomboro. So we kick things off with an incredibly powerful land, a land that's so strong, I'm almost a little surprised that Wizards printed it, and it's a land that has a bunch of special versions that show the different seasons, which I really love because it calls back to the original Mishra's Factory, which had the spring and summer and winter and fall version, so I really, really like that card style. But the card is Three Tree City, Three Tree City. Legendary land, when it enters the battlefield, you choose a creature type, you can tap it for a colorless or pay two and tap it and you choose a color and add an amount of mana of that color equal to the number of creatures you control of the chosen type so if this sounds familiar three tree city is essentially nykthos shrine to Dix, one of the strongest lands that wizards has printed i would say in the last decade of magic except for a creature type rather than a color and i think that it is almost as powerful i think nykthos might be stronger overall because i think it's easier to flood the battlefield with pips of the same color than creatures of the same type but i think it's very close to being that powerful if you want to squint really hard you could even argue it's kind of gaia's cradle at home this land that if you're playing a deck that's all the same creature type it's gonna make a mana for each creature you control of course you gotta pay two mana and tap it so it's not as good as gaia's cradle which is a good thing because cradle is pretty busted but this is just a new staple for tribal decks in literally every format in the history of magic like it's gonna be huge in standard kind of the theme of Bloomboro is all these weird creature types, right? There's raccoons and frogs and otters and these creature types that aren't really supported. And I think why Wizards printed this card is we have seen in the past that these tribal decks haven't done very well in standard. Wizards tried to print knights, let's say, and Eldraine or whatever, and they just don't really catch on. They're not strong enough to keep up with just the generic good stuff decks. So I think Wizards wanted to print a card that was so strong that your raccoon deck, let's say, might actually have a chance to keep up in standard. So I think that was the idea of this card, but along with being good in basically any deck that's playing a whole bunch of creatures of the same creature type in standard, which we have a lot of things to Bloomboro. I think you'd play this in Modern, in Elves, in Pioneer, and Elves. If you're playing a Vampire deck, I could even see it taking off all the way back to Legacy in some sort of Elf-style tribal deck. It's just that strong of a card. And then in Commander, this goes in any deck that cares about a single creature type. So if you're playing Lathril, you play Three Tree City. If you're playing Cranko, Goblins, you play Three Tree City. Maybe Giada Angels, Three Tree City. Chatterfing Squirrels, Three Tree City. Miram Dragons, I don't even care, Three Tree City. The card is just so good. And the cost of playing a copy of it, it is legendary. So there's a cost of playing a bunch of them. But the cost of playing a single copy of this is so low that I think pretty much every deck that is a tribal deck is gonna wanna run this card. My only concern for this card is I think this card might end up ridiculously expensive. This seems like a card that should be great in Commander. It should be good in Standard. I think it can see you play in formats like Modern even. So I would not be surprised if this card was pretty pricey. Although thankfully it is at Rare rather than Mythic, which should help a little bit. Outside of just straight up creature tribal decks, the other place that I could maybe see this card seeing play is with things that make a bunch of tokens of the same type. Like Secure the Waste. You make X11 Warrior Tokens. Or White Sun Zenith. You make X2 
two cats. In a weird way, these cards kind of make themselves free with Three Tree City. Like you dump all your mana into Secure the Waste, leaving up just enough to activate Three Tree City, and then you get a bunch of warrior tokens, and then you just make all that mana back with Three Tree City, cast a bunch of other cards. So this card is just straight up ridiculous. For my money, Nykthos is the best land, the strongest land they've printed in the last decade of magic or so and i think this is almost on its power level so i would be absolutely shocked if this card was not the chase card of the set showing up in multiple formats and being incredibly powerful to even broken in the right decks we've seen nick those be straight up broken at various times and i think three tree city is very close to that power level we also got a cycle of mythic seasons so we only got three of them so far but they're kind of interesting so i'm going to show them all together so you can see what they're trying to do and then we'll go through them one by one so uh, let's take season of the bold is our example so it's a five mana red sorcery it says you get to choose up to five I've paws worth of modes a very bloomboro thing to do with all these animal folk running around and then you can choose the same mode more than once if you want so for one paw you get to create a tap treasure token for two paws you exhale the top two cards of your library until your next turn you can play them for three paws until the end of your next turn whenever you cast a spell it deals two damage to up to one target creature and all the other seasons are formatted the same essentially you get five paws worth of value out of them and get to choose how you want to break that up so season of the bold first mode the one pull mode it's essentially strike it which a little bit worse because it makes a tap treasure token so you're gonna have to wait a turn to use the mana but still for five mana you can make up to five mana worth of treasure so that's one option with this card you spend five mana you go one pull mode one pull one mode one pull mode one pull one one pull mode end up with five treasures the next turn you have a ridiculous amount of mana you cast something huge and win the game but you could also break it up the second mode the two pull mode is essentially ren's resolve so maybe you need some card advantage you can like ren's resolve yourself maybe you render yourself twice and then use your last paw to make a treasure token so then you can use the treasure to help cast the spells you got with the rens resolve or maybe you're behind on board and you're worried you're gonna die so maybe you choose the three paw mode so whenever you cast a spell until your end of your next turn you get to deal two damage to a creature and then maybe you rens resolve to get some cards to cast and you try to cast a bunch of spells and shoot down your opponent's board so these cards they look a little over costed right if five mana it looks a little expensive but you got to remember these flexible charm style cards always punch up they're always stronger than they look at first glance thanks to the flexibility that they offer so i'm not sure exactly where you play this card my first thought was like maybe the pia deck or quintorius deck where you can take advantage of casting things from exile could also maybe just be a ramp card like i think one of the sneaky modes of this is just five mana make five treasures next turn i untap and like ulamog you or portal to phyrexia you so there are definitely possibilities i think it's more of like a build around style card though than something you just jam in every red deck but still a super powerful effect we also got the black member of the cycle in season of loss so season of loss also five mana also gives you five paws that you can spend on modes mode one for one paw each player sacks a creature for two paws draw a card for each creature you control that died this turn for three paws each opponent loses x life where x is the number of creature cards in your graveyard so this is essentially innocent blood you could innocent blood five times each player sacks a creature which I guess kind of makes it a wrath in most situations you can maybe draw some cards with bounty count like if you have some creatures on the battlefield maybe you have each player sacrifice three creatures so that's three paws and then spend two paws to draw three cards for your creatures that died and then the last mode is basically gris ultimate where you're gonna drain your opponents for the number of creatures in your graveyard which of course you can get creatures in your graveyard by sacrificing them for the one paw mode I can't believe I'm saying pause so many times, but here we are with Season of Laws. So I think the baseline of this card is it's kind of a five mana wrath in a lot of matchups. The downside is if you just choose the one paw mode five times, each player sacks a creature. If you're up against a token deck, which might be a thing after rotation, thanks to Bloomboro itself. But if you're up against a token deck, it might not be great because your opponent might be able to sack some tokens rather than their good creatures. But in a lot of matchups, this is just going to be, I wrath both boards for five man i kind of making it a crux of fate the other possibility is you play this in some sort of sack deck where you want to sack 
your creatures for value? Maybe you're stacking greedy freebooters and making treasures or crawling choruses and getting tokens out of them. So then you can kind of break the symmetry of the sacrifice mode. And then in some sort of like self mill deck, that last mode becomes really scary. And we're always talking every spoiler season. Is this the time that Urborg Lurgoyf is going to work? Is this the time that Cruel Sobnophage is going to make it? And they never do, but I never learn. So we talk about it every time anyway. But maybe this is the time, thanks to that last mode, if you can aggressively self mill enough and you're a deck that cares about creatures, which if you're playing like Urborg Lurgoyf or Cruel Sobnophage, you pretty much do because that's what they want as well. You could just aggressively self mill. And as long as your opponent doesn't have graveyard hate, you could potentially just kill your opponent with that last mode, the three palm mode. So I actually really like Season of Loss. It is five mana, so again, it's not something that's going to go in every deck, I don't think, but it seems like a really powerful effect. Our last season so far is Season of Weaving. So six mana blue sorcery. You get five paws worth of modes. One paw mode, draw a card. So this can be six mana, draw five. Two paw mode, choose an artifact or creature you control, create a token that's a copy of it, and then three paw mode, return each non-land, non-token permanent to its owner's hand. So this one is kind of tricky to figure out. My first thought is, it reminds me a little bit of Sublime Epiphany, right? This massive blue six mana spell. The thing is, Sublime Epiphany didn't really see that much play, and that was an instant, so you could kind of try to time it to resolve it around your opponent's interaction. Is a six mana sorcery, I'm a little skeptical that this card is going to see that much constructed play. I hope I'm wrong, though, because it's a super cool effect. Being able to, like, copy one of your things and draw some cards, or you can do some neat synergies. I like how these cards build on themselves so you can like make a copy of a creature you control to get a token copy of it and then bounce everything but you won't bounce the token because you don't bounce tokens and you got a token copy so there's some neat little synergies there i think if you look at the modes of this card drawing five cards if you just go all one paw mode drawing five cards for six mana it's kind of like a promise of power you don't lose any life which is nice and then the second mode reminds me a little bit of like three steps ahead you can just use it to copy an artifact or creature the last mode some mass bounce you are going to miss tokens which again we'll have to see what the meta game looks like in our current meta missing tokens wouldn't really matter too much you're just going to bounce everything but there are a lot of token mechanics in synergies in bloomborough so if we end up in a very token heavy meta then maybe it's a drawback and it doesn't bounce enough so we'll have to wait and see i think this card at a minimum seems like a really sweet commander card in commander you just get a lot of value out of this card being able to bounce everything and draw a couple cards or whatever it seems like a nice kind of safer not as brutal replacement for something like cyclonic rift in standard little skeptical that sorcery speed is six mana it's gonna make it but we'll have to wait and see because it does offer a lot of value if you can resolve this and like draw five cards you're essentially refilling your hand plus you get a bunch of upsides with the flexibility as well so all in all i think this cycle is really really sweet we'll have to wait and see it is kind of expensive just how powerful the cards end up being moving on with our mythics we have a new frog wizard noble in glarb calamities auger and i have to say this set might have some of my all-time favorite magic art, or at least for recent magic sets. Some of the old magic art's so good. But for recent magic sets, my god, is this art amazing. And the names are hilarious. I love this set so much. So Glarb, a three-mana two-four. It's a Saltine Legendary Frog Wizard Noble. It is Death Dutch. It says, you can look at the top card of your library at any time. You can play lands and cast spells with mana value four greater from the top of your library. And you can tap it to Surveil too. So we've seen a lot of these cards recently. These creatures, or sometimes non-creatures that let you play off the top of your deck. Glarb is kind of an interesting mix. So on one hand, as a three mana two four death toucher, that's essentially Preacher of the Schism. And we have seen Preacher, based mostly on the combination of Death Touch and its body, be a really strong standard card. Four toughness plus Death Touch lets it trade up, it stonewalls on defense. So its body by itself on Glarb is actually kind of impressive. And then it's sort of like an Augur of Autumn almost, right? You get to play lands off the top of your deck. And then you get to cast spells off the top of your deck, but only expensive ones. So you got to be mana value four or greater. And then Glarb actually helps set it up as well. So the way these cards fizzle, if you've ever played with an Augur of Autumn style effect, is you chain together a bunch of spells, and then you usually end up with your second land on top of your deck. And you only play one land a turn, so it stops the fun. But Glarb lets you change the top of a deck with the surveil mode. So that's a way that you can keep churning through your deck and generating card advantage, assuming that you're built around its ability. So I actually think that Glarb might 
might be kind of powerful a couple of notes on this card so when it says you can play cards with mana value four or greater from the top of your library what this means is you can't play x spells like villainous wealth let's say you have 20 mana you're gonna cast it all into the villainous wealth it still doesn't work because the mana value of villainous wealth is always going to be three on your library so there's no way you can use it to cast a villainous wealth on the other hand you can do some cheaty things with this like a treasure cruise it's mana value is eight but technically you're often going to cast it for one mana thanks to delve or grief it's four mana but you can cast it for free by evoking it or mirror enforcer it's seven mana but if you get a bunch of artifacts it gets cheaper all these cards are fair game with larb you can still cast them even if you're spending zero mana on them as long as the mana value is four or greater i think if you really want to stretch maybe you could play this in modern it does pitch to grief it does pitch to subtlety it also lets you cast these cards off the top of your deck because they're four mana even though you're going to be evoking them for free most likely it fills your graveyard if that's relevant as death touch so it can trade up in combat not saying this is a modern staple but it's not that much of a stretch that i could imagine a world where there was a modern deck that wanted this effect i think where it will have a home for sure outside of standard where i think it could be a very good standard card like we talked about earlier but it seems like a solid salt eye commander style card you can play this in graveyard decks like tasker style decks or madrotha decks where this is a nice support card in the 99 where you're filling your graveyard you're making extra land drops or you can play this as your commander in place of these cards and just stuff your deck full of expensive things so you can maximize the power of its play off the top of your deck ability it's also a pretty cute frog commander it doesn't care about frogs in specific but in salt eye it does unite all the colors of frogs frogs are kind of split between blue green and black green and this is the first legend that we've had that's a frog that is actually in all those colors so if you want to go full on me mode and play your Grolnox and gitrogs and yargles and mutanis glarb is the perfect commander there as well so glarb we've seen a lot of these cards recently the play off the top of your deck they all tend to be relatively good in the decks that can support them so i expect that glarb will be pretty good as well not a card for every deck but a cool build around in commander and a powerful effect for standard and maybe even eternal formats we also got a new rel in otter rel i still don't really understand how rel turned into an otter I don't even know if I want you to let me know in the comments, but Rao correctly wit. So Rao, four mana, four loyalty. Its static ability is when you cast a non-creature spell, put a loyalty counter on it. You can plus one to make a one, one blue and red outer creature token with prowess. Negative three, draw three cards and discard two cards. Negative 10, the big one, the fun one, draw three cards. Then you get an emblem with instants and sorcery spells you cast have storm. So Rao correctly wit. I really am not sure how to evaluate this card so on one hand the thing that it reminds me of most is jaya fiery negotiator and if you were here a year or two ago i was really high on jaya i thought jaya was going to be one of the best standard cards from dominaria united because it has what you wanted of a planeswalker right it's plus ability makes a token historically that makes for strong planeswalkers it generates card advantage that historically make strong planeswalkers it's got a powerful ultimate that should win you the game copying your spells a bunch of times and it turned out that jaya just hasn't really seen any play and i think that rel is kind of similar plus one make a one one prowess token a negative that generates card advantage an ultimate that'll win you the game if you can cast a bunch of spells however there's one thing that sets rel apart and there's one reason that i'm going to say that rel is going to be really good or at least i'm going to try to make it really good unlike Jaya, and that is it's kind of like our new modern horizons 2 rel the static ability on rel the ability to add loyalty to it whenever you cast a non creature spell i think that's what makes this card good we've seen rel monsoon mage which isn't formatted exactly the same but if you cast a bunch of spells it flips around gets enough loyalty to ultimate right away rel crackling wit can kind of do the same thing on the battlefield if you can play this and then sling a bunch of cheap spells you could theoretically ultimate it the turn it comes into play and that emblem of giving all your stuff storm a mechanic that usually isn't allowed in the standard seems not just really powerful but super fun plus you get to draw three cards to make sure you have something to storm off with i will say i think the negative three is kind of jank like draw three discard two is like thirst for discovery or thirst for knowledge if you don't discard the right thing and if you're just discarding two cards it's not really worth it so i think that mode is not very good but i am excited to playing this in a spell slinger deck and just trying to rush the ultimate to essentially get a thousand 
in your store that's an emblem and three cards in my hand to start casting with it because some of the most spectacular games of magic that i have played in the last few years involve sticking a thousand year storm and just absolutely going off and Ral's ultimate is essentially thousand year storm where you're just going to copy your spells so many times it's even better in some ways because thousand year storm specifically cares about instants and sorceries it's kind of a watered down version of storm while Ral just has literal storm so any creatures or whatever that you cast are going to up your storm count as well so is Ral going to be a good card I will say I hope so I'm definitely going to try to build around it I think think that the static ability might make it pretty good but I still have that little worry in the back of my head that oh, I was really high on Jaya and Jaya ended up flopping and this does look a little bit like Jaya but it's an otter planeswalker so I'm definitely gonna root for it to work we also got a new elemental elk and look at this art I just gotta say the art in this set is so incredibly awesome like Almost every piece is so good, but Biza the Bounding Sprig. So Biza, four mana, four five. It's a white card. It's a legendary creature elemental elk. When it enters the battlefield, create a treasure token. If an opponent controls more lands than you, you gain four life. An opponent has more life than you. Create two one one blue fresh creature tokens. If an opponent controls more creatures than you, draw a card. If an opponent has more cards in hand than you. So this card, it's a catch up card, right? We talk about this with white all the time. Like their catch up ramp is pretty iconic, but I think this card is way better than most people probably think for one really huge reason and that is a four or five for four is already really above the curve for white. I actually went back through the history of magic. I could find a single white card that was a four or five for four, and that's Crude Rampart, which is a wall that can't even attack. So you're starting off with a really good baseline. Let's say you don't trigger any of these modes. You're still getting an above the curve creature. You're getting the white Shieldred, let's say. And we've seen Shieldred, the extra toughness, being a four or five, be huge in how much it has been able to dominate standard at various points. So all this to say, Biza is a good creature on its own. You wouldn't play it if it's a vanilla creature, obviously. Uh, you're getting all the upside of maybe triggering its abilities, but if the worst case happens and you trigger zero abilities, it's not the end of the world. You're still getting an above the curve creature. The upside to this card is ridiculous though. If you think about what this can do, if you somehow trigger all the abilities, which will almost never happen, you essentially get to strike it rich, sacred nectar, raise the alarm, and whispers of the muse, draw a card, two one ones, four life, and a treasure token, which is ridiculous. Most of the time, you're probably gonna be triggering one of these, two of these, maybe three of these if you get lucky. It's gonna be hard to trigger all of them at once, but that's still a lot of value so if you're looking for comparisons since there's not really a clean comparison for the body i think it's going to be something like timely reinforcements or sunset revelry but way better again where the comparison falls apart is again you get behind a four or five body which is something these cards don't do timely reinforcements sunset revelry they're really good when they're good but there's also times when they do literally nothing and you can't even cast them breeze is not like that breeze is always going to be a four or five but then sometimes when you're behind it's also going to gain you a bunch of life or make a couple creatures or draw you a card or make a treasure token i think this card can just see play in any mid-range style deck in its colors i think it's good enough that you can just jam in any mid-range deck and trust that you're going to get enough value out of it sure you can't really control what you're going to trigger but you're probably going to trigger something and you get a good body it also could be a very good control card we'll have to see what control looks like wandering emperor going to be rotating that's one of its big hitters that's going to be gone but there's still three steps ahead there's still sunfall so i think that maybe this could be a really nice creature in control because remember in control you're almost always going to have less creatures than your opponent so that's an easy one you're usually going to have less life than your opponent so that's also an easy one hopefully you have more lands uh, hopefully you have more cards but if this is a four mana four or five that makes two one ones and gains you four life that's actually a really really solid threat in a control deck one other thing i want to mention i saw some people talking about trying to like blink this card and panharmonic on this card and that kind of works although it doesn't work with all the modes because remember uh let's say you play this and you trigger the gain for life mode you're four life higher so if you blink it now you might have more life than your opponent so that mode won't trigger anymore if you make two fish you're gonna have more creatures probably more than your opponent so then that mode won't trigger anymore so i don't think it's as good of a blink target as some people have mentioned but i still think Brisa not only has awesome art but is a super strong card they should be able to see some standard play at least we also got a new ridiculous black mythic elemental bird because i guess owls aren't real creature types but that is definitely an owl i do know that in maha it's feathers night so it's a five mana six five 
Legendary Elemental Bird. It has Flying and Trample in Ward of Discard a card, and it says creatures your opponents control have base toughness of one. So this card seems insane to me. So if you think about this, we've just seen Vein Ripper be really good in various places. As a six mana six five flyer, this is one mana less. It is legendary, which is a drawback, but this is one mana less. You're getting the same stats essentially, these above the curve stats. You're getting the Ward of Graveyard Trespasser, which isn't like you can never kill this ward, but having to discard a card is a pretty powerful ward. And then most importantly, you get a very interesting ability, which is giving all your opponent's stuff of base toughness of one, which can be pretty abusable. I don't know if you remember, we've played some decks in the past built around Overwhelming Splendor and Curse of Death Hold. So Overwhelming Splendor turns all your opponent's creatures into one one, also loses abilities. So it's actually stronger than Maha in that sense, but it turns them all into one ones. And then Curse of Death Hold makes all of your opponent's creatures get negative one, negative one. Like Knight of Souls Betrayal does the same thing. So I think that's probably the most exciting part of Maha. If you can get this on the battlefield, there are ways that these random cards either turn into full-on locks or turn into super cheap brass like glistening deluge always gonna wrath your opponent's board shrouded shepherd for two mana gives creatures your opponents control negative one negative one into one turn that's gonna wrath away all your opponent's massive creatures because they all have beast toughness of one so i think this card has a lot of implications for standard. You can build around it as like a janky brew around. You can also just play it as this ridiculously big threat that's gonna make your opponent's creatures die more easily and get in a ton of damage in the air. It combos really well with Massacre Girl Unknown Killer. Massacre Girl makes it so if a creature opponent controls dies, if its toughness was less than one, you draw a card. So if you go back to those cards we were just talking about, like a gl Glistening Day Loose or a Shrouded Serpent, they're gonna kill all of your opponent's creatures, but they're also going to make all of their toughness less than one so not only do you wrath your opponent's board for one or two mana you're also going to draw a card for each creature your opponent controlled so i think that's one way to build around it once you get outside of standard the card gets even more ridiculous like in commander it, this card's going to be so brutal i think this is going to be a hated commander i would not be surprised to see this show up on some of the salty commander lists in the future because it the best thing to do with it is just turn it into a repeatable board wipe like play pestilence a four mana enchantment that for one black mana does one damage to each each creature and each player well this isn't going to hurt your stuff too much right because your stuff probably doesn't have one toughness but all of your opponent's stuff is going to have one toughness so for a single mana you just wrath the board each turn or you can play knight of souls betrayal so all your opponent's creatures get negative one negative one forever or caravic the spiteful same thing other creatures get negative one negative one with these on the battlefield <laughs> along with maha your opponent's essentially locked out of playing creatures for as long as your combo pieces stick on the battlefield, which is ridiculously brutal. There's also some other neat shenanigans, like Doran makes it so each creature assigns combat damage equal to its toughness rather than its power. So Maha makes everything's toughness one, and then Doran makes your opponent deal damage to you equal to your creature's toughness. So that means all your opponent's creatures are not only going to have one toughness, but they only deal one damage when they attack. Or like Yagmoth, you can sack a creature to give something negative one, negative one every time you sack you can just snipe an entire creature tox roll puts a negative one negative one counter on each creature on the end step so it's just gonna repeatedly wrath the board so i think that maha is actually really sweet there's some really cool ways to build around it i would be very surprised if this card was not good enough for standard just as like a fair standalone threat plus once you start building around it the card becomes absolutely brutal we also got Yagra Eater of All. So this is another mythic. It's a five mana six six Golgari Elemental Cat. It looks like a tiger or something. It is Ward of Sack of Food, which sounds really good, except until you read the next line of text, which is other creatures are food, which might be one of my favorite lines of text on a magic card. It's a big tiger and it's just gonna eat everything. So to eat everything is food. So every other creature is a food artifact in addition to their other types. And they have pay two, tap, sack it, gain three life, just like a food. And then when a food is put in the graveyard from the battlefield, put two plus one plus one counters on Yagra Eater of All. So Yagra, this card's kind of interesting. A five mana six six is above the curve. And then it has kind of ward sack a creature because every creature is going to be a food so it's essentially ward sack a creature not ward sack a food but then as things die they're all food so your yakra is going to get bigger so it's going to turn into a pretty big voltron threat so i'll start by saying i don't think this card is good enough to see play fairly in standard like the get ravenous ride 
a hasty 6-5 that can potentially draw you a ton of cards if you saddle it. That hasn't been good enough for standard. So I don't think a 6-6 with no trample and no haste is going to be playable in a generic sense. So I think what you need to do with Yagra is build around it. Because this card can do some really weird things by turning all other creatures into food. So like Cauldron Familiar is somehow a food that also has sack of food to return it to the battlefield. But if you think about it, like in standard generous plunder, just wants a lot of artifacts on the battlefield. Sir Ginger wants artifacts to be going in the graveyard. Knight of Sweets Revenge lets you tap your food to add mana. So with Yakarau, all of a sudden generous plunder is going to be dealing tons of damage to your opponent. Your Sir Ginger is going to grow whenever any of your creatures go to the battlefield. Knight of Sweets Revenge can let you tap all your creatures for mana. And then once you get into older formats, you get like Marionette Apprentice to drain when artifacts go to the graveyard in commander you can like play agra and then vandal blast or bang of progress to just blow up all the creatures on the battlefield Karn the great creator shuts down all the activated abilities and remember this isn't going to hurt itself because it only turns other creatures into food so if you bane a progress or whatever you're not going to blow up your agra that's going to stick around and you're probably just going to kill someone because you play the bane of progress you blow up all the other creatures on the battlefield which all happen to be food each one's going to put two counters on yagra so it's suddenly going to be like a 30 power creature and then you just one shot commander damage kill someone also works pretty well with death triggers it is kind of this weird sacrifice outlet like if you turn your mind slicer into a food you can whenever you want to just pay two and sacrifice it to gain some life but also make everyone discard their hands or sacrifice a bear heavens to gain a little bit of life and blow up all the permanents at the beginning of the next end step so it's also like this weird expensive sack outlet so yagra i gotta say i love this card i'm not convinced it's a very good standard card. Like I said, if Gitrog isn't good enough for standard, outside of like a combo developing where we can take advantage of the fact that everything's a food, that everything's an artifact, but outside of a combo, I don't think you can just play this on raid in standard, but this has to be one of my favorite designs. Like the idea of this massive tiger that just everything is food to it and then it eats things and gets stronger as it eats the design is so incredibly good so i love this card i'm excited to play with it in commander excited to build around it maybe in like standard or pioneer we'll have to see how good it is but the design is just so so cool all right so let's move on to some of the tribal stuff from the set so as you know the set's built around 10 different creature types so for the next portion of the video we're going to be talking about cards by their creature type because they kind of make sense together so let's start with rabbits with rabbits we got a mythic in warren war leader so it's a four mana four four rabbit knight it has a new mechanic in offspring of two so what offspring means is when you play the warren war leader you can pay an additional two mana and if you do you get a one one token copy of it so it's going to be exactly warren war leader Except it's going to be a 1-1, one, one, but it'll have all the abilities, all that. It'll be a token. And then it has, whenever you attack, choose one. Create a 1-1 one, one white rabbit creature token that's tapped in attacking. Or attacking creatures you control get plus one, plus one until end of turn. So first off, the offspring mechanic is super sweet. It's kind of like kicker for creatures, where for some amount of mana, you get this 1-1 one, one copy of it. I guess maybe the best comparison is kind of squad. The difference between it and squad, just so it's clear, is squad, you could pay the extra mana any number. Number of times so you can make a ton of copies of the card with offspring you're basically making a little baby rabbit to go along with your big rabbit it's kind of like yuktabi orangutan you know yuktabi orangutan but they build a whole mechanic based on the art of that card uh, <clears throat> i was not expecting that but well done wizards but you get a little baby copy to go along with the big copy i think that warren war leader itself seems pretty powerful there's some nice synergies for offspring uh, if you have a panharmonicon effect like elishnorn you're gonna get two copies rather than one copies because it's an enter the battlefield trigger if you have an anointed procession or other token synergies you can really get value out of offspring so the offspring mechanic itself love the mechanic as far as war and war leader it's kind of like a mix of pina and leonin war leader it is worth pointing out that its ability is when you attack not when it attacks so if you have another creature on the battlefield and you play this and it's summoning sick you attack with that other creature you're still going to get to trigger it and make a rabbit or pump your creatures but it kind of reminds me of a mixture of these two cards just a way to force through even more damage and remember if you paid the offspring cost you're gonna have two of these going which is gonna be even more damage even more tokens when you attack i think it's best home 
outside of maybe a rabbit deck, which we'll see if that's actually possible, is going to be some sort of go wide token style deck, right? So even though this is a rabbit card, outside of making a rabbit token, it doesn't actually care about rabbits. You'll see as we go along, some of the tribal cards, you really got to play them with the other members of their tribe. Uh, when some of these cards, you can kind of just play in a generic sense. War and War Leader is one of those cards that you can just play generically. So I think its best dome is probably going to be some sort of, almost like the Boros Convoke deck we have in standard, some sort of deck that's really good with flooding the board with creatures can go super wide and then this comes down to just pump your team like a sanguine evangelist or make more tokens like a resolute reinforcement to help you close out the game so some sort of like top end of my aggro token style deck is the role i see for war and war leader and you do the same thing with it in commander i think sure play it in rabbits if you can build a rabbit deck but good in tokens anything that's like looking to curve out and force through a bunch of damage and go super wide speaking of rabbits we also got phineas ace archer so a two mana two two rabbit archer with vigilance and reach it says when it attacks put a plus one plus one counter on each other creature you control that's a token or a rabbit then if creatures you control have total power 10 or greater draw a card so phineas is kind of interesting obviously if you're gonna play it you need a bunch of tokens or a bunch of rabbits or some sort of mixture two mana two two vigilance reach it's kind of fine unfortunately it doesn't snowball itself when it attacks it only snowballs your other creatures so for this to trigger repeatedly you're gonna have to somehow be able to keep attacking with a 2-2 which seems like it might be kind of difficult however i think its first mode can be powerful enough that it might not even matter so where do you play this card well one option straight up rabbit deck we're just talking about war and war leader we do have a couple of rabbits that are left over in standard like pollen shield hair regal bunny corn that also kind of go in the same style deck right i don't know what bunny corn and pollen shield hair think of these <laughs> these folky kind of rabbits i imagine you'd feel pretty bad if you're a bunny corn and you're like can't talk or walk you just gotta chew on the grass with your horn when you got war and war leader it's like going to war and shooting arrows and stuff uh, but you know psychology aside i do think they work really well together they all want you to do super wide they want you to put a lot of tokens on the battlefield a lot of rabbits on the battlefield so i think that's one possibility it also is kind of like a rub about raiders but way cheaper and this is what kind of convinced me this card could work so obviously as a 2-2 you're not going to be able to attack with this again and again and again. The idea you're going to snowball this and like draw a bunch of cards and keep growing my team, that's not likely to happen with this card. But if you can make a wide enough board, it's only two mana. It's an incredibly cheap rate for putting a plus one plus one counter on each of your creatures. So maybe all you really need is one attack with it. Sure, it's going to die, but a two mana creature that your opponent has to block and worry about that gets in one attack and puts a plus one plus one counter on all your other creatures and maybe draws you a card, that might be good enough even as a one shot considering that usually this effect of putting a plus one plus one counter on your entire team usually starts at four mana so this is a huge huge discount so phineas if there's a go wide rabbit token deck i think this could serve a role it might not be a four of in the deck but i certainly think it could serve a purpose as a way to just force through a bunch of damage by putting counters on your dorks we also got a rabbit lord in valley quest caller so a two mana two three rabbit warrior non-legendary it says whenever one or more rabbits bats birds and or mice you control enter the battlefield scry one so a little bit of card selection and then other rabbits birds bats and mice you control get plus one plus one so this is a two mana lord that you can play bats birds and mice but we're gonna leave those out for now because remember it is a rabbit warrior and if you look at other lords in magic like lord of atlantis valiant veteran leaf crown visionary they are always the good ones are always the same creature type that they're supporting so sure you could play valley quest caller in your bird deck the problem is it's not a bird so it's not going to benefit from additional copies of itself it's not going to synergize with the rest of your deck so i think the extra text of like bats birds and mice i think that's kind of a limited thing in limited maybe you have a deck that kind of has all those creature types but in constructed at least this is a rabbit card it's a lord for your rabbit deck and it's a pretty good one if you look at lords historically what do you want out of lords you want them to be two mana and you want an additional upside that's what makes a constructed playable lord lord of atlantis valiant veteran leaf crown visionary valley quest caller kind of hits that mark it's two mana it even has an extra toughness somehow a little power creep there is a two three and it has the upside of scrying as you play your other rabbits or birds or bats or mice but a way that you can filter through your deck and that's actually very very powerful because if you're playing one of these go wide aggro creature decks the way you're going to lose a lot of the time is just drawing too many lands and this is a 
way that you can scry extra lands out of the way or scry four lands if you need them in a pinch. So I think this card's actually really good. The only question is, are there gonna be enough rabbits to make it work? And the answer is maybe. Like hop two, it's really nice. An uncommon that just makes three one one white rabbits for three mana. So that by itself, already a really good start. That's already a very playable card. You play your Valley Quest Caller, the next turn you hop to it, you have three 2-2 two, two rabbits along with the Valley Quest Caller itself, and then you get to scries to dig for something. Plus, remember, we are talking about 3 True City and the amount of mana it can make, so this would work really well there as well. We're just flooding the board with rabbits, using that Nikto style to make a ton of mana. So I think the Valley Quest Caller, if there's a rabbit deck, this card is a huge reason why that deck will exist. We gotta wait and see. Rabbits are just not a very supportive type there's only a handful of them existing in standard most of them aren't very good so we'll have to wait and see if this deck's going to be good it's going to be good because of blurm burrow and cards like valley quest caller so that's my only catch and that's something that's going to come up a lot throughout this video is all of these weird creature types that aren't really supported the question is really going to be do they get enough support from bloom burrow itself to make them work so we're going to have to wait and see but i actually have high hopes for rabbits the cards we've seen so far seem really strong and valley quest caller is undoubtedly a really really good lord moving into the realm of squirrels we got camella the seed miser so a three mana golgari three three legendary squirrel warlock it has menace other squirrels you control have menace whenever you sack one or more food you make a one one squirrel creature token and then it has a new mechanic in forage so you can pay two in forage to put a plus one plus one counter on each other squirrel you control so what is foraging foraging actually pretty simple it means either sacrifice a food token or exile three cards from your graveyard you can do either one that counts as foraging so camilla this is a pretty strong effect right three mana three three fine stats you get menace thrown in maybe you have some other squirrels to give menace and then you can sack food to make squirrels or sack food to grow your other squirrels so in a squirrel deck the card actually seems very very powerful the challenge for squirrels is there's only one in standard right now and that's and that's prairie dog not to laugh at prairie dog prairie dog is you know very cute but uh there's just not a lot of support for squirrels in standard so if squirrels is going to be a real deck in standard it is solely going to be based on bloomborough which might be a big ask although we are getting a couple more good squirrels uh, that we're going to talk about in a minute thorn vault forager is a mana dork a thippomancer adept which uh, doesn't really care about squirrels in specific but is a powerful effect and maybe this could be played in like a food deck that would be the other option is try to use this is an army in the can style card along with food like Brizzlebud farmer makes food yaruk turns everything into food so maybe rather than being a squirrel deck i can imagine a world where you play this with food primarily and Kamala's just kind of an army in the can so the idea would be you make a bunch of food you sack the food you make squirrels and then you can sack extra food to grow the squirrels so if this is like a three mana three three that comes along with two or three extra one ones across the course of the game because you're just playing a food deck and sack food that's probably good enough on its own without needing other squirrels in your deck so i think that's the other place this card could see play seems really sweet with cauldron familiar witches i'm not sure if it's actually like gonna make the cut in a format like pioneer it might be too much of a stretch the cauldron familiar list already seemed pretty solid so do you want this kind of slow card but as you're going through the cauldron familiar loop of sacking food you're just gonna get an extra squirrel every time which is a nice little bonus so maybe it could see some play there seems really good in chatterfang uh in commander if you're playing a chatterfang deck i don't know why you wouldn't play this card just to like give your team menace and then you can do some foraging to grow your squirrels once you make a bunch of chatterfang tokens so camilla strong card but her squirrel strong enough let's talk about the other squirrels we saw today thorn vault forager two mana two two taps for a green or if you forage you can tap for two mana of any color combination so if you sack a food or exile three cards from your graveyard and you can pay for tap it search your library for a squirrel reveal it put it in your hand so this is a strong card right it's a mana dork it can potentially make multiple mana and it can tutor up squirrels so it is a strong effect although that last mode which might be the strongest on the card you do need other squirrels in your deck to make it work so it is kind of dependent on the other squirrels that we see in the format one of the marks against this card is somehow we got three two mana mana dorks today along with thorn vault forager we got tender wild guide which 
if you're not squirrels might actually just be better than thorn Vault forager and then we got wandertail mentor which i guess is kind of like the uncommon version of the effect but there's going to be plenty of options if you want a mana dork that costs two mana there's going to be lots of options for it so where could we actually play this card and i think maybe the strongest thing you can do with it is somehow make cheap food like on turn one and then use this as an explosive two mana mana dork on turn three play it on turn two turn three ramping like a huge five drop and we do have a few ways of doing this like ginger brute is a food that's one mana corvald haunch is a food that's one mana hollowed scavenger can make a food for one mana none of these cards outside of ginger brute i guess are especially playable so we'll have to wait and see is it actually worth building around that but that's one possibility is this is just like a turbo ramp effect the other place is if there's a squirrel deck you're gonna play this in and a squirrel deck it's gonna be great you tutor up your squirrels you do some foraging it's gonna be excellent our last squirrel is the one squirrel that doesn't actually really care about squirrels like at all Osseomancer Adept. So a two mana two to Death Touch Squirrel Warlock. Its ability is tap until end of turn. You can cast creature spells from your graveyard by foraging in addition to paying their other costs. If you cast a spell this way, the creature enters with a finality counter. So this is essentially Underworld Breach on a body, but only for creatures. So that means you're not going to combo like you do with Underworld Breach, right? You don't have the Dark Rituals and the Lion's Eye Diamonds and the Seething Song. So this isn't going to be, I activate this once and I just win the game which is generally how underworld breach sees play but adept i think is still a very good card so i like that it has death touch is a two mana two two not a great body but death touch means this can trade up for the biggest creatures in standard this can take down shielder this can take down bonnie ball and then its ability i don't think you need to combo with it to make it good i think you can just play it for value obviously probably going to be at its best in some sort of self mill that cruel somnophage or borg lure guy we're going to keep trying to make this work where you fill your graveyard and then you use adapt to just cast a bunch of stuff from your graveyard but it might actually be fine just for value maybe you just play this in a mid-range deck and you're like in the late game i just like play my adapt and hope it lives and then i tap it and i recast a shielder that died i recast a dread knight or whatever so it seems like it might just be good enough as a standalone card thanks to that death touch letting it trade up in combat so adapt i think the card's really good and it's the only one of the squirrels that doesn't really need to be in a squirrel deck to work we also got a couple of otters starting off with alania divergent storm so a five mana three five legendary otter wizard it says whenever you cast a spell if it's the first instant the first sorcery or the first otter spell other than alania that you cast this turn you may have target opponent draw a card if you do copy that spell you can choose new targets for the copy so alania I mean, it seems like a really fun commander, right? You get the politics of gifting your opponent's cards, and it's worth pointing out that the way this is worded, you can copy up to three spells each turn with this, right? Your first instant, and your first sorcery and your first otter so it's not uh, the first of either of those it's the first of each of those which is actually a pretty strong effect and it works during your opponent's turn so you can be flashing at otters or casting instants so you can actually get a lot of copying value off this at first i thought it was like a double vision where you just copy one spell each turn but it's actually a lot better than that so this is not designed i don't think to be a standard card i think in standard you probably just play it and it's gonna die if you can somehow untap with it I guess you can get value out of it, but remember, the value is kind of outweighed by the fact that if you do it, you're going to be giving your opponent a card, so it's not just all upside. In Commander, I think the card looks really fun, although we have so many Is It Spellslinger commanders. It's hard for me to get super excited. I think the upside to this one is it's Is It Spellslinger, but with otters. So if you want to be playing other otters, like for example, Thunder Trap Trainer, that's where this card can really shine. That's something that it does that Stella Lee and Niv Mizzet and V Rand and Mizix aren't going to be able to do. Thunder Trap Trainer. I really like this card. This, yeah, it is kind of like an Otter Spellslinger card, but it doesn't need to be. It's a two mana one two. It has Offspring of Four. So you can pay an additional four, get a one one copy of it. When ATBs look at the top four cards of your library, you can reveal a non creature, non land card from among them, put it in your hand, put the rest of the bottom in a random order. So this is just a really solid little value card. It's kind of like a Felicia archaeologist, digs a little deeper, but it doesn't fill your graveyard. And we've seen historically two drops that when they enter the battlefield, dig through your deck to find something be pretty good like glint nest crane saw a ton of play Seder wayfinder saw a ton of play watcher for tomorrow's even saw some play in modern so i think that this card in a deck that's full of non-creature spells it's just a really nice support card and you get the 
upside of offspring where in the late game if you top deck this and you're kind of like eh, it's not super impactful being able to just dump a bunch of mana and get two copies and draw two cards that makes it even better so in some sort of spell singer deck maybe the row deck we talked about earlier or just any like a control deck it reminds me a little bit of auger of bolus is another good comparison when I mean, auger bolus saw a ton of playback when it was in standard i think in a deck like that thunder crypt trainer probably going to be really really good as far as the rest of the rares we get a new bird legend in Castrol the Wind Crested. So five mana, four or five, Bird Scout. It is flying. It says whenever one or more birds you control deals combat damage to a player, choose one. You can put a bird card from your hand or graveyard onto the battlefield with a finality counter. You put a plus one, plus one counter on each bird you control or draw a card. So Castrol one thing this has going for it is there are additional birds in standard it doesn't have to just pull support from bloomboro even interrupter actually pretty good cards he's played back to pioneer modern coveted falcon has seen some play in fringe decks slick shot show off really strong not sure it's for a castrol deck though goose mother could see playing a castrol deck so there are other birds in castrol is pretty strong with a bunch of birds right so this triggers whenever one or more birds deals combat damage to a player which in 60 card formats means you can play this attack with another bird trigger it right away and put a counter on things or draw a card or put a bird into play from your hand it gets better in commander in commander since you're gonna have three opponents if you can send a bird to each opponent you can actually trigger it three times so you can choose all the modes or one of the modes multiple times which makes it much more powerful and i think that's really kind of the goal of this card i don't think wizards really designed it to be a standard card to me it looks like it was designed to be be a pretty sweet bird commander uh in standard i think it's just gonna be too slow like it's stats are fine but not that exciting you gotta get in damage with birds of all things to actually trigger it uh, i think though one of the downsides of this card is when i first read it it's first mode put a bird from your hand or graveyard in the battlefield i was like oh my god this is gonna be ridiculous like a cheating a creature into play for free is so strong the challenge is it only works with birds so the biggest baddest birds are kind of like wind brisk raptor avian Grader, guari like these are fine cards they're not bad or anything but just remember you're not going to be putting like an emerkel into play or something there's no bird that's just like put me into play and i'm going to win the game on my own but still putting a six drop or seven drop into play for free that is a lot of value and it's nice that you can get it back from the graveyard plus you can just be drawing cards or growing your team so there is some flexibility there so castrol I'd be surprised if it made it in standard, but I do think it'll probably see some play as a commander for birds. We also got a raccoon warrior in Mira Trash Tactician. So three mana, two, four, legendary raccoon warrior. It says at the beginning of your first main phase, add a red or green for each raccoon you control. Whenever you expend four, you gain three life. Whenever you expend eight, exile the top two cards of your library until the end of your next turn, you may play those cards. You're probably wondering what is expend? And the answer is, Wizards decided to make a mechanic that simply rewards you for <laughs> playing the game and casting your spells. So expend means when you spend that amount of mana on spells in a turn. So whenever you spend your fourth mana on spells in the turn, with Mira, you're going to gain three life. And this works on your turn or your opponent's turn. So if you can spend four mana on spells during your turn, you gain three during your opponent's turn, you do it again, gain three more. And then if you expend eight, which is spend your eighth mana on a spell for the turn, you get to exile the type of cards in your library, you do a Rens Resolve, play them until your next turn. I think this is a pretty powerful card. So again... <sighs> raccoons are we gonna have enough raccoons to really power up that first mode maybe not if you can't be a raccoon deck this is like battle him every turn plus you get to revitalize as you cast your spells and rens resolve as you cast even more spells but i don't actually think you need to be a raccoon deck to make this card good right now there's i think five raccoons in all of magic and three are going to be legal and standard after rotation so we're going to need a lot of good ones from bloomboro to make a raccoon deck but i don't think you actually have to be a raccoon deck what if this is like a top eerie stomper where remember this is a raccoon so you play mira and on your pre-combat main phase you're gonna make an extra mana so it's kind of a top eerie stomper as long as it uh, sticks out you're gonna make an extra mana each turn maybe you throw a bramble familiar or something into the mix where maybe you get two mana a turn out of it that by itself is pretty good and then as you're making this extra mana and using it to cast spells you're gonna start gaining life and generating card advantage so it's just gonna keep snowballing so i think that's the use of this card is this actually just seems like a good like mid-range or ramp style card maybe you're ramping into a tally you're ramping into a troxa there's no top 
Fury Stomper anymore, maybe this just making that one extra mana and gaining you some life to stabilize and maybe drawing through your deck, that might be enough to make Mirror actually work. So I'm actually kind of high on this card. When I first thought, I was like, there's just not enough raccoons to make it work. But the more I thought about it, even if this is just a standalone card, the expend mechanic on the other hand, I mean, it's good, right? It's just rewarding you for literally playing magic. What do you do in a game of magic? Is you cast spells. So I guess it's very strong, but it's a little bit boring, I think. Like, ugh, I don't know. Like, you're going to be casting spells anyway. Do I really need to be rewarded for that? So I don't know if I'm the biggest fan of Expend in specific, but it is a very powerful effect and pretty confident that Mira, best raccoon ever in magic, at least so far. We also got the return of class enchantment. So we see artist talent, a two mana enchantment that you can pay mana to level it up to the next level only as a sorcery. So when it comes down, it's immediate mode is whenever you're casting nine creature spell you can discard a card if you do draw a card actually a very powerful effect three mana gets you to level two which is non-creature spells you cast costs one less to cast and then three more mana gets you to level three which is the source you control would deal non-combat damage to an opponent or a permanent that opponent controls and deals that much damage plus two instead and just so it's clear uh, you probably know what classes are because we've had them around for a little while now but you get all the modes right so if you get up to level three you don't just get level three but you're still gonna get level two and level one so i think the first First thought with this card is its first mode is pretty good. We've seen Jeskai Ascendancy, which this is no Jeskai Ascendancy. It's not just going to power through a combo and win the game on its own, but the ability to, whenever you cast a non-creature spell, discard and draw, that's actually a really strong effect. It's very good at filling your graveyard. It's good at filtering through and finding what you need. Maybe you got madness effects or something, but there's a lot of utility there. Just being able to churn through your deck, get rid of extra lands, find whatever important card you're looking for. The second level essentially gives you a Goblin Electric mancer which is a really strong effect we've seen this time and time again in spell slinger decks that reducing the cost of your spells is really good and it plays well with the first mode your spells are cheaper and they're still going to be rummaging and then the last mode you kind of get a torbrand but only for non-combat damage which if you're going to be trying to win by casting a bunch of burn spells let's say is a nice way to close out the game so in a spell slinger style deck i think the artist talent could be a pretty playable option at least in standard probably in commander in modern it gets a little bit tougher i don't know if it'll make it in modern maybe pioneer i could see this being like a pioneer card in some sort of spell slinger deck but i do think artist talent has some potential we also got we also got kidnap so kidnap it's a four mana aura and it has a new mechanic in Gift on it. So this is Gift A card. And what this means is when you play Kidnap, you can promise an opponent a gift. And that gift is drawing a card when this enters the battlefield. So Kidnap itself, it enchants a creature. When it enters the battlefield, you tap Enchanted Creature. If you didn't promise a gift, you put three stun counters on the creature. If you did promise the gift, no stun counters. And then you control the Enchanted Creature. So I gotta say the Gift mechanic... I don't know how good it's going to be for standard. I think it will be kind of interesting. I hope it's interesting. Sometimes when it comes to 60 card formats, people just immediately write off any effect that's going to give their opponents value. And normally that's the right thing to do because you're trying to get ahead of your opponent, not give your opponent things. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how Gift actually plays in standard. With a card like Kidnap, it's a little bit better, right? Like if you choose not to give the gift, you're still getting a pretty powerful effect, which is stealing your opponent's creature. It's just gonna be tapped for a few turns before you can use it. So it's still gonna be perfectly fine. If you do give the gift, this is literally control magic, which is very, very strong. Where I think this mechanic will really shine though is in Commander. In Commander, you get to give the gift to any opponent. So it doesn't have to be the opponent that you're kidnapping. Uh, so you can steal, let me say Richard's creature. I can steal one of Richard's creatures, but maybe Richard is super far ahead. And I'm like, I really don't want to give Richard a card. I can give Tomer the card because Tomer is super far behind because he's only playing basic lands. Uh, so something like that. So I really like the politics of this mechanic for commander in specific and the flexibility of it for commander in specific. Uh, as far as this card actually seeing play in standard, we have occasionally seen cards like Kidnap or Control Magic be sideboard cards. If you're like a mono blue deck that doesn't have that much removal and you're really interested in dealing with a specific threat. So I think there could be a world where this sees play. Although it is worth pointing out, it is an aura. So one of the downsides of this card is if your opponent kills it, they're going to get their creature back. Some of the best of these effects now are just like sorceries. It just like steals the creature. But I still think that Kidnap could have some uses. Control Magic, pretty iconic card. And this is about as close as we've seen to an actual Control Magic 
Michigan standard in quite a while. Moving into the world of Commander, we also got one of my favorite parts of the set, which is Imagine Critters. So these are reprints that are creatures and iconic planeswalkers reimagined in the animal folk style of Bloomborough. So in the commander precons, uh, you're getting these planeswalkers. Jace the Mind Sculptor is a fox, Tamio is a rabbit, Liliana the Dark Realms as a squirrel, Nissa <laughs> is a hilarious looking frog. Plus in collector boosters, there's gonna be more of these. We see like Chatterfang, for example, which isn't a planeswalker, but it is kind of like a animal folk squirrel now rather than a normal squirrel. So these cards doesn't change legality. Jay's not gonna be legal and standard, not even necessarily coming to Magic Arena because these ones are in the commander precons, but really sweet reprints with pretty whimsical Bloomborough art. We also got uh, one reprint proper and run away together. Uh, not super notable, but the art is super cute. We also got the four face commanders from the Bloomborough Commander pre-gods. So let's go over these four super quick, starting with Miss Bumbleflower. So Miss Bumbleflower, a four mana one five, it's a bant rabbit citizen. It is vigilance and it says whenever you cast a spell, target opponent draws a card, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature, it gains flying until end of turn. If this is the second time the ability to resolve this turn, you draw two cards. So this is obviously a group hug commander, kind of a Feldegrift, a Quine, a Canty. And actually I think it's a pretty scary one to play because the problem is, uh, if you think about how this works, every single spell you cast, in some turns you're gonna cast has more than one spell, right? A bunch of spells. You're going to have to let an opponent draw a card. Sure, as long as you can cast two spells in a turn, you also get to draw an extra card, but that's more cards that you can cast to make your opponents draw cards. So I worry that this card is actually going to be really tough to play because I feel like the amount of value you're going to give your opponents is going to be too high. However, if you build around this effect and kind of don't make it so group huggy, I think it's actually legitimately exciting. What if we fill our deck with cards that either stop our opponent from drawing extra cards with Miss Bumbleflower and then we just get to cast spells and we draw extra cards and grow our stuff and give it flying or actually makes us benefit from our opponent drawing cards so we could play Spirit of the Labyrinth, Narset Parter Veils just to keep our opponent from drawing so many cards like our each opponent can draw one card each turn but if we just keep targeting the same opponent every time we cast a spell they're not going to draw additional cards even better maybe we play stuff like Smothering Ties so when an opponent draws a card they got to pay two or we get a treasure and we just keep targeting whoever don't have any mana up so we make a ton of treasures so then we can almost like storm off and like draw some extra cards and keep casting them. Or we can play like Fairy Mastermind, Wedding Ring, Consecrated Sphinx. These are cards that will make it so when our opponent draws cards, we get to draw even more cards. Like imagine having a Consecrated Sphinx out with a Miss Pumbleflower. You're going to pop off. You cast a spell, your opponent draws a card, you get to draw two cards with the Consecrated Sphinx and just keep going. Every spell you cast, sure your opponent's drawing a card, but you're drawing even more. So when I first saw this card, I was like, oh my God, this card's going to be so difficult to play. But the more I started to think about it and build around it in my head, the more excited I got from Miss Bumbleflower. I think this card might actually be pretty sweet if you build around it. We also got Hazel of the Root Bloob. So a four mana three five legendary squirrel druid. It has tap, pay to life, tap X untap tokens you control any token, not just creature tokens, and X man of any combination of colors. And then at the beginning of your end step, create a token that's a copy of target token you control. If the token was a squirrel, make two copies of it instead. So Hazel the Root Bloom, it's kind of like a populate commander. Essentially on your end step, you're populating, right? With the upside, if you populate a squirrel, you're gonna get two of those instead of one. So it kind of reminds me a little bit of a guy raid or something. These commanders that can populate each turn, but it also has a little bit of Jahira mixed in the first ability of paying two life and tapping it in X tokens to make a mana for each of those tokens. It's kind of like a mostly worse version of Jahira's ability where your tokens you just tap to make a mana. Uh, you can split up the timing better with Jahira. With Hazel though, it does fix your mana and it can just make a ridiculous amount of mana. And I really love that it works with non-creatures as well. So you can tap all your treasures and clues and foods to make a huge amount of mana. And then it also reminds me a little bit of like Chatterfang, just a squirrel token style commander. So I think that Hazel 
Hazel the Rubloom. I really like this. You can just play it as Squirrel Tokens, and Squirrels are really good at going wide. Play your Deep uh, Forest Hermit, your Deranged Hermit, your Squirrel Nest, and just try to make a ton of Squirrels and use the mana from Hazel Bloom to ramp into huge finishers and be able to make even more tokens thanks to the last ability on Hazel. You could also go like big tokens with Hazel since you're populating each turn. If you don't want to go Squirrels, you could kind of ignore the first ability and be like, I'm going to play a Desolation Twin, and it's going to make a 10 10 token. And on my end step, I'm going to make another 10 10 token or a Renin 7 or a Frexian processor. These effects that just make really, really huge tokens. So I really like the flexibility of Hazel. You can go Squirrels, you can go Go Wide tokens, try to make a ton of mana with the first ability, or you can go Go Tall tokens and try to make a few copies of these huge tokens to close out the game. So actually, a really interesting and flexible commander. We also got Zinnia Valley's Voice. So a three mana one three Jeskai Bird Bard. It is flying and it gets plus X plus zero, where X is the number of other creatures you control with base power of one, which actually can be a pretty scary Voltron effect. And then creature spells you cast have offspring of two. So you pay an additional two when you cast it and it ETBs, you get a one one token copy of it. And Xenia is another commander that I think can go in multiple directions. So my first thought was, Build that like a Voltron commander. You play Zinnia, and then you play a bunch of things that make 1-1. One, one. Spectral Procession makes 3. Secure the Waste makes a ton. Even better, play creatures that make 1-1s. One, like Mirror Battlesphere, the massive 7 mana 4-7. When it ETBs, you make 4 1-1s. One, but then remember, we have Offspring on Zinnia, so we can play Mirror Battlesphere and pay 2 extra mana, and we're going to end up getting 8 1-1s one, in 2 Mirror Battlespheres, one of which will be a 1-1. One, one. Or like a Cloud Goat Ranger makes a bunch of 1-1s. One, Use Offspring to copy it. Regal Caracal makes some 1-1s. One, so with these effects, it seems pretty easy to play our commander and then just flood the board with 1-1s one, to make Zinnia into like this huge one-shot kill threat and just Volt and kill our opponents in like one or two attacks maybe throw an extra combat step or two to take out the entire table but that's one direction you can go so that's kind of like the aggro build the other direction you can go is just full-on value down and be like i'm gonna just fully embrace this offspring thing and i'm gonna evoke a mall drifter draw two cards pay two extra mana get a one one mall drifter draw two more cards or evoke a null drifter draw a couple of cards get a free null drifter spirit companion i'm gonna offspring it make a little baby spirited companion maybe you add a pan Monicon to the mix. So you could just play it like this weird Jeskai ETB value commander where you just try to like copy all of your stuff, throw in some token synergies where you got your anointed processions and things to make even more tokens. So I actually really love this card. I love that it can be an aggro deck, but it could also be built as one of the most dirtly commanders imaginable. Finally, we got Bellow Bard of the Brambles. And speaking of commanders I love, shout out to Wizards on this one because I think they kind of nailed it. Girl, well, maybe not as bad as like is it spell slinger or boros equipment but gruel commanders a lot of them tend to be the same just like ramp into big things but this one's very unique so it's a three mana three three raccoon bard it says during your turn each non-equipment artifact and non or enchantment you control with mana value four greater is a four four elemental creature in addition to its other types and it has indestructible haste and whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player draw a card so bellow it's a gruel commander that wants you to play a bunch of non-equipment artifacts and non-aura enchantments and the reward is a specifically expensive ones so gotta be four mana value or greater but if you play these and ramp into these its reward is going to be giving you a bunch of indestructible hasty four fours they kind of tosky and draw a ton of cards so this is a really cool build around some of the best cards in a bellow deck i think are going to be these like kind of valuey dirtly enchantments like elephant chorus is going to let you play off the top of your deck omen path journey going to do a bunch of ramping stolen strategy going to generate cards advantage these cards are already good cards but they get even better when they're going to be turning into hasty indestructible four fours and smashing and beating face with your opponent you can do the same thing with artifacts also worth mentioning it doesn't specifically say non-creature it says non-equipment non-aura but it doesn't say non-creature which means we play a solemn simulacrum form an artifact turn it into a four four hedron archives conduit of worlds so i think that's how you build this you just uh, care about something you normally don't care about in gruel if anything gruel is awesome often like the anti-artifact, anti-enchantment color, where you're really good at blowing up those card types, but you don't usually play a ton of those card types. So I really like that Bellow is just giving Gruul something it normally doesn't get, a really unique commander, another one that I'm really excited to build around. So I gotta say, overall, I think Wizards did a really good job with the face commanders, Flumbroomboro, 
probably the most boring is Hazel, and even Hazel seems like a really good card, but it's still like Golgari, like Squirrel Commander, but almost all of them are super unique, super weird, gonna make you play cards you wouldn't normally be playing, which is exactly what I want out of Commander cards. Finally today, in the realm of lower rarity cards, there's actually a ton of them. Uh, we're not gonna get to all of them in this video, already way too long, but there are a couple I needed to mention. One is Fell. So Fell is... Two mana, sorcery, destroy target creature. So this is the cheapest unconditional way to kill a creature that has been printed in magic. So normally kill anything with no restrictions is three mana. I will say, I think that Fell is actively bad and I do not think this card will see playing constructed. I believe that people will value the instant speed aspect of stuff like go for the throw or bitter triumph over the unconditionality of Fell. So my expectation is this card actually isn't very good just because it's sorcery speed. If this was instant speed, this would be a staple back to pioneer for sure. Maybe Maybe see some modern play even, but at sorcery speed, I think it kind of just kills the card. So Fell, even though it has an exciting mana cost, when you consider that it's a sorcery, I don't think it's really that good. It just wait a few more years till uh, we get the instant version, and then you have a real card. We also got a couple of gift cards that I wanted to mention, just because they seem so good for Commander. I kind of mentioned this earlier when we were talking about gifts. So first off, parting gift, two mana instant, gift a tab fish. So you gotta choose to give an opponent a 1-1 one, one blue frisk creature token if you want to do the gift thing. It says, exile target non-token creature. If the gift wasn't promised, return the creature to the battlefield under its owner's control with a plus one plus one counter on at the beginning of the next end step. So this card, I really love. So you can use this for two mana to blink one of your own creatures. It'll come back on the end step with a plus one plus one counter, reuse its enters, trigger, or whatever. Or if you give an opponent a 1-1 one, one fish token, you can get rid of one of your opponent's creatures, exile it forever. It's not going to come back, getting around in destruction ability, getting rid of commanders, and again, like we talked about earlier, it doesn't have to go to the same opponent, so I can give whoever super far behind the 1-1 one, one fish and get rid of something from the arch enemy, so I really love how this is going to play in commander. The other one that's so good is Weird Out, so Weird Out, 2 mana sorcery, destroy target artifact or enchantment, if the gift was promised, destroy 2 artifacts or enchantments instead, and the gift is give a card, so you can choose to give an opponent a card, pull up 2 artifacts or enchantments for 2 mana, just an incredibly efficient deal, even at sorcery speed. So this is another card I think has potential to be really, really good in Commander, just as a way to get a cheap two for one and maybe curry some political favor by giving someone the card. We also got, as I mentioned, a ton of lore rarity cards. And some of these are like kind of functional. I don't think uh, too many of them are like straight up broken, but like Storm Chase Mentor, really good. So this is stuff that might see some standard play. At worst case, we'll see a lot of play in limited. So you should go over to MTG previews, check out all these cards, see all the signposts in common for draft. This video has just already been incredibly long, so we're not going to go through all of these cards individually, but check them out over at mtgpreviews.com. Anyway, that brings us to the end of our daily Bloom Burrow spoilers for today. And I gotta say real quick, on the way out the door, I know it's been a long video, this set is amazing. The art might be the best art that I've seen in a Magic set in like 10 years. Like, it's so incredibly good. The flavor's good. The mechanics are generally really good. The cards look fun and interesting. So, so far, I think this set is going to be a huge success. Well done, Wizards, on this one. But I want to know what you think. We went through a ton of cards today. What are you most hyped about? What are you building? What do you think of the set? What's your hype level? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll be back tomorrow with even more Daily Bloom Burrow spoilers. So until then, have an amazing day, and I will talk to you soon. Looking for even more magic? Well, check out our Nadu vs. Hagak battle here, or maybe the video about how Wizardus is monetizing modern.